Hey everyone, this is a question I've been thinking about for some time now. Has laptop technology evolved to the point where one portable thin and light machine can replace a reasonably high-end desktop PC for gaming? And can that same laptop also double up as a heavy-duty 4K video editing workstation? And how about this? Can that same machine also replace a high-end Ultrabook star machine like the MacBook Pro? So yeah, essentially, can we get everything we need, all of that performance, all of that functionality delivered in a thin and light chassis that also has all day battery life. Well, I've been checking out the MSI GS65 Stealth, a notebook I've had on test for a few months now. Core specs, well, let's just say that they are indeed formidable. The Core i7-8750H beats at the heart of this machine. Six cores, 12 threads, peak all-core turbo I've seen of 3.9 gigahertz. So in theory, it's not far off a desktop 8700, which peaks at 4.3 on all cores. Next up, there's the GPU. In this case, an NVIDIA GTX 1070 Max-Q. So Max-Q is interesting. You get a full-blooded 1070 at the silicon level, but frequencies are dialed back to give the best ratio between power consumption and performance. It's what makes a gaming grade machine possible within a form factor like this. So here's how the 15 inch GS65 compares form factor wise to my battle hardened 13 inch MacBook Pro. You know, the older model before Apple started to go a little off piste with touch bars and dodgy keyboards. Yes, obviously it's bigger, but not that much bigger. In fact, in terms of thickness, the 13 inch Apple machine is just a hair thinner and the overall form factor of this MSI machine essentially the same as today's 15 inch MBP. Screen real estate is certainly on another level compared to my smaller machine as you would expect and the bezel-less display pretty awesome actually. Note that the thin bezels here doesn't mean an awkward placement for the webcam as seen on the likes of the Dell XPS line. It remains exactly where it should be at the top of the screen. Now the screen in question is 1080p, which is fine for this size, but I'd have preferred 1440p for productivity reasons. But it does run at 144Hz. No G-Sync here, as this is incompatible with NVIDIA's Optimus technology, so in this case that does mean better battery life. So on the first point, portability and form factor generally, we've established that the GS65 delivers. And yeah, before we move on, it would be remiss of me not to point out that Gigabyte, Asus and Razer also offer very similar machines with the same core components. So consumers do have some choice here and choice is good. More on that in a bit. Now let's dive into performance and I'm not going to start by talking about gaming for once. You see, here's the thing. When Digital Foundry attends E3 or Gamescom, we have a problem. We have the equipment for capturing 4K 60 frames per second gameplay and indeed shooting 4K 60 video via our Panasonic GH5 cameras. But in terms of editing this stuff, well, you need a seriously decent PC to get the job done. The MSI here has been a phenomenal workhorse for us. Those 4K videos we produced at Gamescom and E3. Yeah, well, compressing footage for transfer while maintaining quality. It was all done on that laptop. The Forza Horizon 4 edit from E3 that John did, a full 4K presentation I should add. Yes, it was edited with zero issues on this laptop. And looking back to Gamescom, the discussion video on NVIDIA RTX that we posted. Yup, you guessed it, it was edited on this laptop. And that edit is actually a decent focus for what these laptops are capable of. So let's take a look at that in a little more depth. So here's the GS65 playing back the timeline of that RTX discussion video smoothly in Adobe Premiere Pro. You can get an idea of how the edit is structured here. Right, so here's the thing. The final video was actually 1080p, but it's built primarily from 4K camera feeds from two Panasonic GH5s. Because it's a 1080p video, we can use cropped areas of the 4K feeds for different perspectives. So each 4K shot has myself, John and Alex in view, but when one of us is talking, we can crop in more tightly on the speaker with no real loss of quality. So effectively, one camera feed 
gives us three different view configurations and two cameras gives us six shots total. So what's special about this? Well, it's simple. What we have here is a laptop that's handling multiple 4K feeds on the Premiere timeline. Video transition effects are usually handled by the GPU. And as we have a GTX 1070 here with eight gigs of VRAM, we're more than covered there for all but our most insane video effects. So let's review. What we're looking for is a laptop that matches the form factor that Apple established with the MacBook Pro. And yes, the MSI GS65 and indeed those rival machines from Razer, Asus and Gigabyte are up to the job. We've also established that the combination of CPU and GPU, and to be fair, the CPU takes point in editing. Well, yeah, these machines do have the power to get the job done. Video encoding wise, man, the six core i7s and I guess the i9 do indeed deliver phenomenal horsepower here. And we don't need to skimp when it comes to syncing in the CPU cycles on the quality of our video encoding. The concept of a thin and light machine is tied closely to battery life though, which I will tackle in a bit. But in the meantime, yes, we do need to talk about gaming performance here. Now on the face of it, a six core i7 paired with a GTX 1070 effectively speaks for itself. But there are some issues to bear in mind here. First of all, Max-Q runs at reduced clocks, so inevitably it is gonna be slower than a desktop version of the same card. But how much slower? That's the question. Secondly, the fans do spin up somewhat when the CPU pushes hard. So do we hit thermal limits and to what extent does this matter? Two important questions there then, but let's kick off with GPU benchmarks. Possibly more important than CPU here as graphics hardware does represent more of a limiting factor to gain performance. We have a 1080p screen here. And so that's where we're going to pitch our tent for our benchmarks. I'm going to kick off with a newcomer to our benchmark suite, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And yes, once again, I am going to compliment developer Nixis, not just on the quality of the benchmark here, which is actually representative of in-game performance, but also on the DX12 implementation here, which is really, really strong and really gets the most out of your CPU. Okay, well, while I've been talking about all of that, doubtless you've been looking at the graphs, which well, they show that the GTX 1070 Max-Q does indeed run significantly slower than the desktop model. In fact, as you can see, it's closer to the 1060 in pure performance terms. Now, we are looking at Pascal architecture here across all three tests. So yeah, we do see parallel lines here on our performance graph. The performance differential staying consistent across the test. And what the numbers reveal is that the Max-Q 1070 in this laptop, on this game, is about 13% faster than the desktop 1060, while the desktop 1070 commands a 22% advantage over its Max-Q counterpart. Interestingly though, the percentages close up a touch on this title's predecessor, Rise of the Tomb Raider, based on an older version of Crystal Dynamics Foundation Engine. And in this case, it's not working to the Max-Q's advantage. Here, it's just 10% faster than the 1060 desktop card, with the full fat 1070 delivering a substantial 26 point lead. Wolfenstein 2 next, which again, doesn't do the Max-Q too many favors here. Now, what I should say is that the frame rate variance on this one is rather wide, so I've had to expand out the grid somewhat. But the bottom line is that we're 9% faster than the 1060 overall, while the desktop 1070 powers ahead with a 24% margin. So initial numbers here suggest that we're looking at the equivalent to an overclocked GTX 1060 from the desktop space here, as opposed to a GPU that can hold its head up high against a desktop 1070. Crisis 3 returns us to familiar territory here, 14% faster than the 1060, while the 1070 in its desktop form offers up an additional 18% of performance overall. Regular viewers will know that this is my go-to title for judging game performance whenever I get a new piece of hardware in. By and large, the most difficult stages do stay north of 60 FPS here on the very high preset with SMAA T2X anti-aliasing. And as old as this game may be, 
That signifies that you're well on your way to running just about everything maxed on this thing. Moving across to the junior engine for Far Cry Primal, the numbers are more in line with the more positive results posted so far. The Max Q1070 delivers 16% of extra performance here compared to the desktop 1060, while the 1070 equivalent outpaces the Max Q by, yup, 16%. Interestingly, I was expecting this title's reliance on single core CPU power to manifest more strongly in favor of the desktop cards paired with more highly clocked processors. But I guess the 1080p Ultra setting here is enough to ensure that we're still GPU bound. Finally, let's finish up with Ghost Recon Wildlands, which at its Ultra preset is notorious for meeting out brutal punishment to any GPU you care to throw at it. Running at 1080p does mitigate the worst of the punishment, but we're still looking at a mere 7% uplift overall compared to GTX 1060 and the desktop 1070, 19% faster. So I guess it begs the question of, well, when is a GTX 1070 not a GTX 1070? Something we've talked about in the past with the Max-Q parts. Well, we do need to remember that Max-Q is all about judging the sweet spot between power consumption and performance. That means a reduction in frequency. So what I'm doing here is using Revatuna Statistics Server to highlight GPU clocks between the Max-Q 1070 and the MSI laptop up against the desktop 1070 Founders Edition I have, which is paired with an 8700K. And you can see that typically in like-for-like -like rendering situations, we're losing around 500 megahertz. So that's a ballpark 30% drop in frequency, which is obviously significant. Now, thankfully, memory bandwidth is the same between the two versions of the 1070, while the mobile version actually has 128 extra CUDA cores compared to the desktop equivalent. But really, it's that frequency differential here that separates the two parts. Power consumption? Well, you get a pretty small and cute 180 watt power brick with the MSI, and I never saw anything more than 155 to 160 watts being drawn from the wall. So when you judge that performance level at that power draw up against desktop standards, it's actually rather impressive. Okay then, so let's review. You've got the CPU power to carry out complex workloads, and based on benchmarks, I'd say it's about 10% faster than a desktop i7 7700K. Pretty decent. You've got a GPU in there that comfortably beats a GTX 1060, typically by 10 to 14%. Okay, so it's not 1070 class desktop performance, but at 1080p, that's still very, very impressive. And it's all in that thin and light chassis. So what are the drawbacks? Well, yeah, the fan noise. It's not loud, but it is high-pitched and grating. Secondly, I'm not 100% sure we're getting everything from the CPU here. Temperatures in gaming hit 90 degrees Celsius pretty frequently, and I'm fairly sure that there is thermal throttling going on here. And here in this CPU-heavy scene from Crisis 3, even with a 60 frames per second lock, temperatures actually exceed 90, and clock speeds seem to vary between 2.6 gigahertz all the way up to 3.9 gigahertz, depending on the intensity of the scene being rendered. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, Crisis 3, it really is an interesting game for pushing hardware to its limits. Finally, despite an all-metal chassis, there is creaking and flexing here on the keyboard area that you just don't get on a Mac or indeed on some of the MSI's competitors, like the Gigabyte Aero 15X. Despite all of this though, the GS65 is an incredible machine in my opinion, just a few steps away from being nigh on perfect. So, could it replace my Mac, my editing station, and my games machine? Well, if I could only have one machine out of the three, this would definitely be the best all-rounder. In fact, it's not really the performance that is the issue here in terms of potential deal breakers, rather the battery life. MSI reckons you'll get eight hours from the GS65, but four to five is more common for non-gaming, non-intensive tasks. And you kind of need to be careful that the Nvidia GPU doesn't kick in on non-gaming tasks, otherwise battery life drops hard. But man, we're close. 
really close to that all-in-one jack-of-all-trades machine. And it's pretty amazing just how much performance we can get from what is a tight power budget. I mean, 150, 160 watts? That's actually enhanced console territory in terms of power draw. So, fascinating stuff overall. And remember, the GPU in this thing is essentially based on two-year-old technology now. We're due a new architecture. Seven nanometer fabrication is on the horizon, and we may well be up to eight core CPUs from Intel by next year too. That's what's so cool about PC technology. The pace of innovation is utterly relentless. I think we've reached a new level here, but the question is always, what's happening next and when can I have it? Okay, so that's where I'm leaving things for now. And of course, you know the score. If you like the video, pressing the like button obviously helps us out, while subscribing takes that one stage further. Ring the bell to hopefully get instant notifications whenever a new DF video drops. And yes, do consider our Patreon, please. Just a small contribution helps the team directly and you get pristine quality downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me for now, though. Thanks so much for making it all the way to the end, if indeed you did. And just generally, thanks for watching.